Thank you very much for taking the time today to view our video. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to introduce ourselves. There are many aspects to 9.connect, but it boils down to the fact that we're a PCB-centric organization. We believe and focus on the PCB due to the fact that it is truly the center point of all electronic design. That's where our expertise lies. We provide services not only in the PCB layout, but in design consulting as well. And during the technical portion of this webinar, you will see this expertise in motion. We are now the exclusive North American instructors for Altium Designer. We host 100 trainings throughout the year across North America, and we are excited to bring these trainings closer to you. In addition to our services, we are also a value-added reseller for a number of PCB-related software companies. And just to note, each company has been presented in past webinars. So if you're interested in them, please contact us or check out our website. And by the way, we provide one-on-one -on -one coaching for these tools as well. For more information on our services and past webinars, please contact us. Our information is listed in the description below. Thank you for giving us a moment of your time, and please enjoy the presentation. My objectives here for today is really just two of them. Number one, I want to establish the principles of cable design and Altium Designer. And secondly, I want to give you an example uh, of, one, of a working cable design with a bill of material. So we've been working at this for years. When I worked at Altium as an, uh, as an AE taking support calls, customers asked us this question all the time, can I use the library for cable? And the answer was, well, yeah, but we don't know how. And it wasn't for a lack of trying. Myself and several others tried to do it. We'd spend hours on it. And we just couldn't get it to work. And then finally, two years ago, I was assisting a company here in Carlsbad, California. And asking them, they, they were asking me, hey, we do cable drawings all the time in PCAD. We're going to continue to do them in Altium. Help us out over here. We really need a library. So I was tasked with this effort to try to make this work for them. And I uh, sweated through it, and I finally dawned on me why we were having problems getting the cable library to work, and it's principle number one. And that is we have to separate the physical aspects of the cable from the electrical. And I can't tell you how important this is, and believe it or not, it's so obvious that it's not obvious. And let me give you an example of that. When we do PCB design, for example, when we're in the schematic editor, what are we doing? We're doing the logical design. And we push everything over to the PCB design in order to do the physical. Okay, so we have to use two editors in Altium Designer to complete a PCB design. What we were trying to do with the cable over here, is we were trying to take a single editor and add both the physical and the electrical in one area all together. And that's just not going to work. It's not possible. And where this thing just kind of st stirred me in the eyes and just said, here's the answer to it, is what the customer provided me. So this is a drawing that they did in PCAD when we imported it into Altium. They said, we want, this is what we do. And when I looked at it, it dawned on me finally that said, you know what? Here's the physical, and here's the electrical. They separated those out. So why are we trying to make everything work within one drawing over here? We need to show both aspects. So that's why it's really important that we separate the physical aspect from the electrical aspect. And in fact, if you look at the E3 tool, which uh, Jeff's going to show here in a couple of minutes, that concept runs across the entire platform of that tool. Separate the physical from the electrical. Okay. And by the way, these slides, as Jason mentioned, are available to you as well. There's a few I'm just going to skip over. This is just the definition of the physical, the electrical, as I see it in my eyes. The net list can be derived from these components, from the electrical aspect of it. You'll see that here in a few moments. Now, the physical, uh, pardon me, the second principle is that all cabling components must be in the library. Okay. It goes back to everything I said two months ago with the Tor libraries and the introduction to libraries. You've got to have these components in the library. Why is that? Well, if we go back to this original design that we have here, and you look at this, these are all three primitives. There's nothing I can do to get this into the bill of material. Because in order for me to get to the bill of material, it has to be a component. In order for it to be a component, it has to start in the library. So that's where this kind of runs dry and at an end. There's no intelligent data behind these wonderful drawings. So as a result, we've got to have the library. But there's an important corollary to this, if that's the correct word for it. Each component that is purchased has to be its own component. And I give the example of a DB9 connector because it never ceases to amaze me how many different varieties there are of a DB9 connector. And in theory, you can buy a separate housing, a separate header, separate pins, and separate jack screws 
for a DB9 connector. And if you do that, each one of these has to be represented in the library. So be very careful about what you're purchasing because there's certain things that are included and certain things that aren't included. So here's an example of one that has the shroud and the jack screws in it. So that would just be one line item. But you would have to buy the pins possibly separately, the header separately. So make sure that those things are being added into your library as separate line items because those get pushed to the schematic and in turn they get pushed into the bill of material. And you need to have a line item for each thing that you're going to purchase. So that's the second most important principle here. The third most important principle that we have here is the call-out. Now in PCB work, we don't worry about call-outs because we really don't work from the schematic. Uh, in fact, if we're ever going to do anything by hand, we most of the time are going to work on, work on it through the PCB side of point of view. Uh, but when we're doing cabling, it's not uncommon to take something like this, and here's the alchemized version of this, by the way, take something like this, print it off, hand it off to the operator and say, here's a bill of material, here's a bucket of parts, build it. Okay? We don't normally do that with PCBs, but in cabling we certainly do that. So that's why it's important that the callout is a part of the library. Because when you have this all together, and you did put this into the library appropriately, when we go to reports, bill of material, this is what you're going to get from this. I'll just give it a minute over here, but you're going to see all the callouts that are coming up over here. And these callouts basically follow those numbers that you see here in each one of the bubbles. So an operator can take this list, can take this schematic, go out there and produce the part for you. And, and for the most part, unless you're doing millions of these things, most of these times these are in the dozens and they're going to be hand done. So that's why it's really important to do this. And of course, also the manufacturer information is in here as well. If I want the manufacturer's name, manufacturer's part number, we can add it. So most of the work is going to be done for you over here. The only caveat that you got is that sometimes with the quantities, you may have to change things. Because when we're talking about a cable, well, I may have listed it seven times, but we're not going to buy seven cables. What we're going to do is we're going to buy a spool of it, or we're going to want to put something in feet, or it may say something like, as required. So there may be some post work that you're going to have to do on the quantities here, but the rest of it's all ready to go, which is a lot better than typing this out by yourself in Excel. Okay. Let's take a look at the library for a moment, just so that you can see how all this stuff kind of plays together. Because you may say in your mind, principle number one is I've got to separate the physical from the electrical. And now you're saying I've got to have one part in the library to be represented in the bill of materials. Well, how are you doing that? So let's take a look at the library here and look at one particular component. So we've got a plug over here. And you'll notice that we are using submodules. And you want to be very familiar with submodules when you're working in cable libraries. And you want to make sure also that when you're doing these things that you keep to a pattern so it's very easy for you and your colleagues to look this up when you go into the library's panel. The way we did this initially and kind of kept along with it was that here is part A, which is the side view. Here's part B, which is the electrical view. Here's part C, because they wanted to have the face view of it. And then part D was our call out. Now, part E was thrown in there, too, as basically a way to add a line item for a bill of materials onto the schematic itself. Some people like it. This company ultimately abandoned that idea because of the changes. Every time they made a change to the bill of material, that represented a change to the cable. And when you had something in production, any rev changes went through a lot of bureaucracy. So they said no more bill of materials within their cable design. But this is the concept that we added in there so that they could stack this one after another as they brought them into the uh, library. So that's why you see that in here. So those are the parts that we have. And you can see that the call out is always a part of every single one of these libraries. And as I mentioned, or we mentioned before, and I'll mention again, the library is something that we also provide as a part of the file package if you're interested in looking at it. Okay. Let me bring this uh, PowerPoint pr presentation back up over here. So let's move on to the next principle. So principle number four is very, very important. Primitives of the component are locked upon placement. I can't tell you how many times this caused a lot of problems for us. So just to give you a little history, you may have seen some articles by a fellow by the name of Stainer Solanke over at Altium, several blogs that he did on cable components. Well, back in 2012, both Stainer and I worked together on this concept. I was responsible for the methodology, methodology of it. Stainer was responsible as the lead librarian to implement it. And as we went along, we found things that worked great for one project but didn't work very well for another project. But this particular principle always tripped us up. What do we mean by that? Well, in the library, if we go to part A over here, I can move things around in my heart's content. All right? These are just nothing but dumb primitives. However, once this gets placed out onto the schematic, it's locked. I can't make a change to it. So here's an example of a library component. I'll page it up here so you can see it. 
All right, I can't make changes to this. If that 28 is in the wrong lo location, I got to go back to my library and make the change and push over the change. I can't change this. I can double click into it, but I'm not going to be able to unlock anything. I can't explode the primitive as we can do in the PCB. All right. Now, oops, let me cancel this. That's why it's chiming at me here. There's one exception to that, and that is the connector here. So let me bring up this connector here and unlock the pin. And by the way, you can do this, you can do this on pins anytime you want, both in the cable and the schematic. And the reason why you might want to unlock those pins is so that you can move the pins around. And actually, let me just grab, push this here so you can just see I can move these around. And you can do this on the PCB side as well. So if you have a really long IC and you don't want to have all these weird wires coming off of it, let me page down here so you can see this. Or here's a better example in the cable. But the same thing applies to the PCB as well. One more click to get that in the center so you guys can see it. If I want these lines to go straight across and not have to have all these right angle bends, I can unlock the pins and move the pins around accordingly so that these lines all go across nice and straight. So yeah, we definitely use this in the cable design, but you can also use this in the PCB as well. So it's just a matter of unlocking it here, right? Unlock the pins. I unlocked this one earlier when I was going through some test runs. But they are locked by default. But I can't make changes to anything else. I can delete a pin. I can change its properties. I cannot add a pin. Uh, and in terms of this triangle, if I wanted to stretch it out, I can't. It will not allow me to stretch it out. It will allow me to move it, but I cannot stretch it. I can't change its color. I can't change the border colors. Any of those type of things, I am not going to be able to make modifications to. So be wise about how you do these things in the library, because once they're there, that's it. Just another example, we wanted to have a note area so that we could each drop a note every time we had something uh, to put down the library. We ultimately had to abandon the idea because the text even gets locked down. We couldn't even modify the text. So each one of these now has to be drawn up in the, the schematic editor itself. So those are the kind of limitations you have to uh, be aware of. So those are the four major principles that we have to be aware of. Now you may be looking at this and saying, wow, those drawings are pretty slick. What do they do to get those together? And there's a process that you can use to get this down to about 10, 20 minutes. The company that I was working with literally drew these things by hand. This is an example of what they used to do. They would draw these things out. They'd get a pair of calipers, maybe a sample. They would get the data sheets. They would draw these out one to one because they did not want their operators to have any confusion whatsoever of what they were supposed to put together. So they'd draw these out in PCAT, and then if they needed to use them, they would open up these sheets that were just loaded with these examples. They would sweep over this, do a control C, and put it into their design. So of course, you had to know where things were. Otherwise, you had no way of indexing it, which is what the, that's the major benefit of using the library. But they were drawing these things uh, literally two, three days to draw these things if someone was just sitting down there and taking the measurements and drawing them out. So the question is, what can we do? Well, the process that we came up with to really shorten that whole effort, because we had to do 55 cables. And all of these cables are pretty much using brand new components. They're using new terminator blocks from a company called Phoenix. So as a result, we had to completely change everything out. So with 55 cables and well over 100 connectors, we weren't going to sit there with a pair of calipers to do this. What we did was we said, all right, look, these companies, any of them that are worth their, you know, worth their salt, are going to give you a step file because the MEs want that. So we took the step file, which is a one-to-one -one rendition in, in 3D. We used SolidWorks, and I assume other capsules can do this, and we actually convert it to 2D images, the isotropic, uh, the front, the side views, the back views. We got those things uh, as a result of this rendering process, and then we were able to save that out as a DXF DWG file, and then we were able to import that into Altium. And then from there, let me just push this over here, and we can't import it into the library, unfortunately. They don't have the ability to do that. But if you can imagine for a moment, and go back to this one, that this got imported here, and you'd have a bunch of free primitives once you've imported the DXF DWG into the schematic sheet. You could do a control C on this, go over to your library, do a control V, now you've got your image, and now you've got your library part. And again, if you're pretty fast with it, I think it took us more time sometimes just to find the part than to go through that process that I just mentioned to you. So 10, 20 minutes can render you a pretty quick and nice, nice and easy part. And again, most of these connector companies are going to provide that to you. The last thing I'm going to mention before I turn the floor over to my colleague, uh, Jeff, is how long does it take to do something of this nature? In fact, this one over here, let's go to this one here. That's the one I want. I'm going to do a view at VS to view fit. Okay. If you're proficient with it and as your library is growing, I've talked to people who are putting these caves together. It really took about one to two days, and that's not really uncommon. 
for any type of cable drawing. And the fact that you'll be able to use a library that's going to quickly show you these things in the library panel, the fact that this is going to kind of draw very similar to what you're doing already in the PCB, it should have pretty much the same look and feel uh, as if you were doing a PCB design. The last thing I'll show you before I turn it over, actually there's two more things I'll show you very quickly just for your information. Um, to place a part into, into here because you're probably saying, well, how do you place it because there seems to be a lot of uh, aspects of it. So let me place this plug here just to show. If I place a part like this, okay, I got my part over here, the two things that you really want to be concerned with is the call-out number and the designator. So in this case, let's say that this one is a, a P10, and I do want to show the designator for this. All right, but I also need to uh, talk about the call-out. Now, I'm not going to show the call-out for the first item, but I do want to have that call-out information in there. And I recommend that you deal with the call-out up front. Don't wait for the end because it gets really difficult, and Alpium right now doesn't have a script or way of just filling in the blanks. As far as I don't know, I haven't really put my thought to that. But uh, unlike document sheets, for example, you know, the call-out number is something you want to make sure you control. So I'll put 20 in there for now just so I can see it. So that's the part A. Okay, and then once part B comes in, here's my electrical. I'll leave it the way it is right now. If I hit the tab key, you'll see that this is still visible, and my call out is still there, and that's good because I want that to propagate. And then the last one, well, pardon me, this one here, same thing. This time I don't necessarily need the designator, so I'll turn it off. But again, you see the call out here. I'll press OK, drop that one down. And then here's my call out, which again is very important. So I'm going to turn on that one, and then you'll see that it will say the call out is 20. And then I'm going to right-click to end it because I don't need the bill of material line. From there, it's really just a matter of dragging these things over to the appropriate location where you're going to you know, either do your physical or your electrical. Make sure I grab that there correctly. Okay? And that's why you want to make sure that those are all set up at once because once you separate them off, it gets a lot harder to recognize and realize where they are. As for the connectivity down here below, this is the last thing I'll mention and talk about, this is just nothing more than lines and busy A curves. Okay? There's no there's no logical or electrical connectivity between the two. It's strictly a drawing for the purposes of visual representation. The last thing is the placement. I'll place a busy air curve on here because it's so funny. I just remember doing training class. Like, why did they ever put this thing in here? And now I use it all the time. So um, I answered my own question uh, very quickly years after. The busy air curve, just to let you know, very useful, and I'm going to give you two tips on doing it. First and foremost, you have to have four points when you do a busy air curve. Okay, Alpine's looking for four of them. So my recommendation is your first point should be where you want to start it. So I'm going to start it here. So here's my second point. Here's my third point. And then let's say I'm going up here. That'll be my fourth point. And Alpine's going to say, okay, I got my four points. I'm done. And I'm going to right click to end it. Once I click on this here, I can use the second and the third point to move things about. And that's the easiest way to do it. You can always move the first and the fourth points, but I've always found that if you put the first and the four down first, then it's just a matter of adjusting the second and the third. That's all the time I got for you guys today. Uh, today. Again, ask all the questions that you want. I'm looking forward to them. I wish I had a little bit more time to get into some, some other details, but I'm going to leave it at that at this point, and I'm going to introduce uh, Jeff, going to represent the uh, or demonstrate the E3 product. I'm going to make you the presenter here. And Jeff will bring up his stuff here in just a moment. Thank you, Paul. Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, I can do, uh, see it just fine. Okay. What I want to do just to start off with, uh, my name's Jeff Leiden. I work with Zucan, as Paul mentioned. I've been working with these E3 series for about 10 years now. And what I plan to do is just talk a little bit about the tool, tool a little bit about Zucan uh, as a company and uh, show you some of the functionality. So this is slide presentation. I'll go through this very quickly because the first question I ask people is, do they know who Zucan is? And most people will say no. So um, we are a global corporation and we are 100% focused on CAE tools, basically electrical design tools. So we do have PCB uh, tools. I'm not going to talk about them, obviously, as you are Altium users. Uh, E3, which is the tool that I'm going to talk about today in more detail. And we also handle product data management. And that's the components 
on a board, for example, or the components in a design so you can track usage and so on. We were founded in 1976. We are actually the oldest EDA company. Um, we've got over 1,300 employees with offices in Westford, which is outside of Boston, San Jose, Munich, Bristol, and Yokohama, Japan, with revenue last year of over 231 million. And for those financial folks, we are debt free. That impresses the accountants. Uh, as far as customers are concerned, it's well over 2,500 customers, and it's actually over 30,000 licenses now. Uh, the staffing, the uh, tenure for this, the people in development, in support, for Zookin averages about 12 years, but for the E3 team, they've been together for now 27 years. They were originally part of HP had tools in the Unix environment, and then released E3 in 2001. Just to give you an idea of the customers that we have, these slides, these next few slides will show you that we do have a major presence in North America and around the world. Probably SpaceX is one of my favorites because they've been using the tool ever since they started. Um, Moving on to the next one, if we're in automotive, if anybody's driving a, uh, a Maserati Quadraport or a Mercedes E-Class, it's done with E3, I like the new one that's coming up, Aston Martin, the Ford F-150, for example, and that car that goes around on a tracks on the weekend that's red and driven by a Spaniard that I'm not allowed to talk about. That's uh, also one of my favorites. As far as the consumer electronics are concerned, if you can watch it, i.e. a TV, play up, uh, with it, uh, a Game Boy or anything like that, um, you ride an elevator, an escalator, it's all done with our tools. Um, as far as phones are concerned, every one except one is uses Zookin tools in design. Heavy machinery, we have a major pres presence with in the machinery market and in power distribution we've got some major installations for power distribution. So that was a quick overview. I don't want to spend much, too much time on it but I just wanted to let you know who Zookin is and that we've been around for quite some time. So if we look at the... Uh, I've got several designs created here and if I go in and we look at this one, this is similar to the one that Paul just showed you. I created this uh, this morning, so I've done uh, probably 80% of it, and it's basically by drag and drop. Now, what I want to do first is to talk about the tool itself, because it is not just a cabling tool. There are several aspects to the tool itself, the first being schematics, and any type of schematic. So you can do hydraulics, pneumatics, uh, for example, if I go down and I look at this one, you can see there's a hydraulic schematic and as well as the electrical schematic. Um, so it is a schematic tool. It is also a panel tool. And by that, I mean if I open up the uh, control panel drawing, we can see the, and if we zoom into it, we'll see it a bit more clearly, we can see a control panel layout, and if we look at the logic in here, we can see the, the logic of the connections coming from the schematic itself. So each of these terminal points is associated with the corresponding schematic symbol uh, on the schematic page. And if we now go in and say auto connect, and I've just selected that specific one, we can see that it is automatically connected. And if we look and hover across a wire, we can see the signal associated with that connection, the size, the color, the length, um, and any options associated with it. So looking at that wire, it's going from here to here. Now the length, even though the tool is a 2D design tool, um, 
it does, in, as far as the panel components are concerned, it does have 3D information. So it knows the height of that connect point from the base. So now we can calculate, OK, I need to go down to the base, the base back plate. I need to go to the wiring trough. I need to come up to my destination and then come from the back plate up to the height of that connection point. And that's how we can get the, um, the true length from the panel, even though as a user, we are working in the 2D mode. So also looking at this, if we look at this talking about cables and we zoom into this part of it, we can see for this motor, we have a cable. The motor itself has a pigtail with a connector on it. We can see the connector on that side and it's connected up to the rest of the circuitry. Um, so this cable itself, if we look at it, there's four conductors here, pins 1 through 10. If I jump to the tree, and that's the device tree over here in the project, I can see those pins, but if I click on these, these terminal, these connector pins are on a different sheet and they're actually associated with the protection circuit associated with that. So within a project, I can have my cable, uh, my conductors of my cables and wires spread throughout the schematic itself, which makes it um, a little bit difficult to actually track them. But if I, because of the functionality provided with cable, I can actually go in and say, well, what I want to do is have a another drawing, and in this case, I'll use this cable pond drawing, that shows all of the cables, or the conductors of this cable in this case. So we can see the original four conductors. We can see the two circuits for the protection, and these two are shielded, and this is a complex cable. So that's an additional view to what we've seen in the schematic itself. And also, I can have manufacturing views and if I hover across, you can see the information about the conductors within this view itself. And then I can have a tabular view. And the tabular view is just telling me what the pin connections are. Now, normally, this would be on different drawing sheets. But for the sake of this presentation and this uh, example project, everything's on one sheet just so that you can see it. And I will go through and uh, show you this functionality later on in this presentation. Now, a quick uh, description of the tool. It is Windows-based, as you can see, just like you would find anywhere else in uh, Word or Excel, similar commands. Um, a lot of drop-downs, but most of the time you don't have to worry about the drop-downs because you can right-click on anything, and the associated commands will appear in the pop-up uh, menu. There is online help. Um, and then if I look at the contents of that, everything is in there that you could possibly want to see. I'm not going to spend any, any time on it other than to talk about the interface. The API, for example, uh, for the tool is standard Windows COM. So you can actually get at any of the data within the project itself. And so you can access all of the data in the project and generate output from that, whether it's a connection list, a wire list, or anything. So all of that data is available. So you can generate output, whether it's for a cut mark and strip machine, whether it's uh, to go to an ERP system, or anything like that, you, um, you can generate output because all of that data is available to you. Now, just talking a little bit about these toolbars, underneath, we've got different sets of toolbars. I'm not going to spend time on the toolbars, but this is the connection toolbar, for example. Uh, this is the control panel toolbar. So you can see uh, different commands within these. This is the form board toolbar. And I'll spend a little bit of time on the form board. And by the way, this toolbar itself, uh, I'm not logged in, but this is for Team Center. We have different toolbars and different in connections to um, PDM systems. So if it's SolidWorks, Enterprise PDM, or WindChill, or Team Center, or Smart Team, we do have interfaces to those. And for the user, it's just a matter of using these um, 
the toolbar specific to that PDM integration. If we look on this right hand side, everything is a window, so we follow everything that um, Microsoft tells us. Um, so everything is a window. You can put these windows any way you wish. I'm using a laptop because I travel a lot, so uh, I leave my uh, screen size is not great, but normally you would stack these up so that you've got more of this blue area, which, which is the working area. And if you have multiple monitors, you could put these other windows onto other um, screens. So now, looking at this library, by default it's in access format because it's on single user, it's on my laptop, but it could be SQL, it could be Oracle, and it would typically sit in a central server that everybody's using. The library itself split into uh, several sections. Symbols be the first one. If I click on any symbol, there's a battery symbol popping up. Symbols exist once, and they're used many times for different components. So however many battery types, for example, and pin terminals that you'll see me use, the pin terminal uh, is one symbol used many times. Components um, in the components tab can use one symbol or many symbols. This is a relay symbol and we can see all of the different uh, symbols appearing up here. And depending on the, the symbol itself, I could also have a corresponding panel symbol and when it's placed in the panel, it will show a lot more information because the panel symbol, like all of the other symbols, um, if we look at this symbol itself, it's just the graphics appearing on a sheet, but you can't see the intelligence, so you can't see the connect points. You can't see all the text nodes that will display information when there's information to display. So it could be the terminal number, it could be the, uh, the part number, the device ID, and so on. So, in addition to the symbols that are used by a component, we also have attribute data. And there's no restriction on the amount of attribute data you can have associated with any component. You've got the freedom to describe the attributes and to have the attribute information associated with the components. And in the final tab in this library, we have different types of symbols that don't directly relate to a component itself. So, for example, I could have sheets, drawing sheets. You'll see I've got many, many different types of drawing sheets in here. It's just a symbol that we add intelligence to. Attribute text templates, you'll see these used. Basically, when you drop these onto the connection, it will interrogate the tech connection and display the information associated with that connection. So if there's nothing to display, it won't display it. But for example, it could be gauge, it could be color, it could be wire number, wire name, whatever it is that I want, I can have that attribute associated with it. And we've got other symbols like shield symbols because we deal with shields um, in the makeup of a cable. So that is that aspect of it. Um, and then we've got other as far as this project window is concerned, this is this window in the top left hand side. What you can see here are multiple drawing sheets uh, that I'm turning on and off, um, including the panel sheet that we looked at, including the cable plan that we looked at, and so on. But in addition to that, there are other documentation included within the project. In this case, PDF documents, Word documents, Excel, any type of file that you want to include in the project. Now, the project itself is just one file. So that gives you several benefits, the first of which is uh, for vaulting and storage and so on, and tracking, it's easy. It's one file, and it includes all of this information. Another advantage is that all of this data, so as I bring things in to the project, it resides in the project. So it's not looking for information from this library. So if I open this up in five years time, for example, and this library is com completely changed, it doesn't matter. This is as it was designed and all the information is in that. The third advantage to this is that I can open this up in the viewer tool, which is free of charge and you can put it on anybody's laptop, and I can 
go through it, I can interrogate it, I can do searches, I can go in and look for things, uh, create, I can uh, outputs, I can generate uh, prints, plots, and so on, and I can jump around just as you can see me when I start to show you things. The only thing I can't do is change it in the viewer tool. So this window is not there. You don't see that one. So that's a, a quick overview and just to recap, what we can do is we can have schematics and it's, it's one tool. I should point out it's one tool and licensing opens up functionality. So we have the ability to create a schematic, all of the interconnections and so on. We can do control panels designs. We can do the cabling views. These are the different views of the interconnections. And we can have form board creation. And the difference between this type of definition and a form board is that it is actually created to real world dimensions as opposed to me drawing it and giving it a, a length. So you could actually plot out a form board sheet onto plywood and actually use that as the base for uh, building a cable, harness, and so on. Other important things is that we deal in objects. And by that, I mean that if I look at this relay and I just drag it on, let me look for the schematic sheet, and I drag it onto the sheet, and so I've dragged on this normally open contact. When I go and look at it in the device tree, so I'll jump to the device tree over here, I can see that I've got the complete object. So I've got the coil, I've got the normally closed contacts, and norm, normally open contacts. This means that I can't overuse contacts because it is exactly as built in the library, so it prevents errors and it's tracking it. And it doesn't matter where any of these pieces are or these symbols are on any sheet, whenever I make a change, that change will reflect everywhere. Other parts of the uh, project tree that I didn't mention were the panel parts. We can see the, the parts that have not been placed in the panel and the parts that have been placed. And we deal with variants and options. And quickly looking at this sheet, what I could do is to say, if I do an overview of that sheet, if I turn off the associated options, I can leave it grayed out if I wish, or I can make it disappear off the sheet as I've got it set in this case, so that when I generate output, whether it's a plot or a bill of material or a connection list, depending on whether it's turned on or off, it will either uh, appear on the drawing sheet and in the bill of material and the connection list or not, depending on the settings. So that, that's a quick look at the tool itself. So now let's go and I'm going to close this one and we'll look at the project that was created before. Now, if we look at this one, I created this one this morning. These are real uh, objects. Um, so I can look at this. I can say, OK, let me look at that by jumping at the tree so I can see every pin that's used. Uh, by, they're in blue, and it gives me a location as to where they are. And I can see the pins that aren't used because they're in yellow, and there's no location information. I can also look at additional views. So if I see this, and you can see the preview popping up of that, if I go and jump to that view, I can see the view of it there. So what I want to do now is to spend a little bit of time and explain uh, what is uh, the functionality of the tool and what cabling gives you over and above the schematic. So I'm just going to focus on the functionality of cable itself. And then we'll come back and look at this example that Paul created before, and I'll show you some. Uh, I'll create a little bit more of that from another example that I have. So, th and this is the one that I will use later on and just complete it so you can see it. But let's talk about the base functionality to start off with. If I look at the this simple D sub, and I'm using a nine pin D sub because I don't want to use something that's got 125 pins and trying to fit it on the sheet. This, this will be fine. So if I just drag this on and look at it, this is a female 
representation, female pin. If I make a connection to that, you can see what the male representation would be. Now, that is a international standard. It could be an arrowhead. It could be anything. It's just symbology. It's the functionality that counts. What I could have also done, now if I take this and jump to the tree, and by that I mean jump to the device tree, what I can see is this icon at this location represents every single pin. Okay? I can also go in and say, well, place every pin. Now for this instance here, you'll see the star 9 that indicates it's every pin of that connector. But in this case, I've got every pin with an individual symbol and we can see that over in the, in the tree. So each of these pins, if I click on them, they will highlight. It's in blue, it has its own location and I could move it anywhere I wanted to. And it could be on another sheet, for example. So if I was to go in and say, okay, let's add a sheet to this project and then I'll take this um, drawing or this pin and put it on that new sheet. So I'm just dragging, dropping it. And now if I jump to the tree, you can see that that's on sheet three as opposed to the sheet two of the others. Going back to this representation, if we now go and look at the same connector and I'll say, okay, I'm only going to use these pins. So I can drag these on. Now if I jump to the tree, you can see the pins that are used, the pins that are available. Because it's an object, as I brought it in, I brought all of the parts of this specific um, connector into the uh, project itself. So I know how many terminal pins I've got within this connector, and I can see the ones that are used and not used. If we also look, we can have different representations. So that's one type. This is another type. If I go in and say, okay, if I drag this one on, that's the equivalent of this representation. So doing the same thing again, if I go in and say, well, I want every pin, I get a different representation. This is a standard used more for uh, military applications. Probably 50% of our customers use this type of representation. And again, if I go in and say, well, I only want to use these pins, notice how the representation changes because it's saying that this representation does not contain all the pins. And the display is controlled by this toolbar up here. So now let's take that, and I'll use the same example, but let's take that and show the functionality of the cable. Now I'm going to do this all on one sheet, and I'm going to make it simple, but it's going to show you functionality. So I'll go in and say, okay, um, I'm going to do an interconnect level diagram. And so it's just connectors to connectors. In this case, I'm only going to use two, and I'm going to make that connection. If I hover across it, you will see that there are no conductors in there. Now, if I go in and say, OK, I want a new device view, and I want to show every pin. OK, so now I want to say every pin of that connector. Now, this extension pound one is something I can turn on or off. And that's just as a guide to say this is another view of something that's already in the project. So now I can go to this side and say place new device view for this one. And we'll flip it so the mating sides are together. And I'll just connect these up. Again, I've not assigned any cable or wire, but I could have by picking the default wire up here. But I want to show you how all of these views are linked together. Again, I could have something more like a manufacturing view. So I'm going to say, OK, let me uh, place this view. And I want it to look like, and notice how this has got many different types of symbols associated with it. So I'm going to make it more like the real thing. Place that one down, and same for this one. Now, often this is going to be a different, it would be many connectors because it's a harness. Um, they could be different types of connectors. I'm just trying to do this. Uh, keep this simple for the time that we have available. So again, nothing within this. 
Um, and then let's say I want to see the tabular view. And this helps in manufacturing purposes. I've got several tables here, but I'm going to stick with this one. And I'll say place that. And this is the table associated with this specific connector. Now, let's go in and say we'll put a cable on that. So what I want is a control cable that has enough conductors. So I've already opened this, so I don't have to search for it. So this has a nine conductor cable, and I can go in and say, okay, let's connect those conductors. And then I can go in. Those conductors are connected. Now, if we look at this and I hover across it, I can see the conductors are now associated with this connection, with this connection, and also the table is now complete. And the table is showing signals. And we'll look at signals a little bit more in a second, but the signal is part of the uh, definition of a connection. So now I could go in, for example, if I wanted to make this more lifelike, I could go into the connection properties and say, okay, let's make this a little bit more like it, and let's put in a dimension associated with it, and so on. So there's my dimension. This is associated with the paper. So as I move it, it changes. But what I could do is to go in and say, well, in the properties, I just want to put a value in there. And I could have got that value from any source, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but now when I change it, nothing happens to that. I could also go into this and say, well, what I want is to, um, I want to cable protection associated with it, and I can stretch that to suit, and so on. And this, this becomes part, part information associated with all of this. So those are some of the things I can do. I can also have documentation graphics. And documentation graphic can be anything. But in this case, I've just got the pin layout. It could be an isometric view. It could be photographs. It could be anything that you want by way of documentation graphics. So that's a quick look at the functionality of cable. And the, the thing about it is this is another view of that, this is another view of that, and this is another view of this particular connector because it's just showing the connections to that side. So that's, that's part of it. Now, let's look at blocks, OK? And I'm going to go in and say I'm going to place a block. and this block can represent anything. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a, um, a receptacle, and I'm going to say place the receptacle on here. Now, whether it's placed on the inside or outside is controlled by these buttons. And so I'll place another one. And these blocks, by the way, can be stored in the library if you use a, the, a block for some uh, specific component, you can store them. If you look at this one, this has got PCB information associated with it already. Now, the block itself represents any device. Uh, it could be a commercial, uh, a purchase device, for example, where you typically don't care what's in the inside or don't know what's in the inside, but you know what connectors are on it. So it could be. In the case of an LRU, it could be many connectors with many, many pins on each connector. So if we now connect this up, and I'll just make the connection, there's a connection. Now notice if we zoom into this, we can see several things. First of all, it's put the mating connector in that because it knows the mating connector. Also, the signal is transferred through. So we deal with signal transfers. Whereas, for example, a wire would go from A to B, a signal would go from A to Z, uh, depending on how many interconnection it goes through. So if we look at this, and we look at the device properties, and we look at the signal on the pin, on that specific pin, and I'll just change that, uh, and I'm just going to put my name in this, just to give it a name, just to give it a signal name, and say, OK, now notice how that transfers across and we can see the signal associated with the wire. Now, if I go into this and say, OK, what I want to do is I'm going to put in a, um, a receptacle and plug, and I'm going to say, OK, place the single pins. Now, notice it puts its mate in there. So now we've got a breakpoint. So I'm going to unplug this pin, 
just the one pin of this specific uh, connector that's an intermediate connection between these two. And now if we look at the device properties of this, um, we go into the device properties here and I'll say that this one, again, just putting any name in. And so now I'm going to say there's my names. Notice how Fred transferred through because it does transfer, but the Joe didn't because it's not connected. And when I do connect it, it now flows through. So signals go all the way through. Wires just go from A to B. Okay. Now let's look at, I'm just finding space on my drawing sheet. And what I'm going to do now is just to say, okay, uh, just to show you some more functionality. And I'm, I'm showing you pieces of functionality as opposed to uh, making it too complex because all of this functionality adds up to create the design. So now we'll place this one. And what I'm going to do in this instance is I'm only going to connect up to uh, two pins of each connector. And what I'm going to do is to connect these with a shielded cable. So if I look here, I want a shielded twisted pair. So there's a shielded twisted pair. And I'm going to connect this. And so there's my uh, connection made. And by the way, if we look at this, I'll just close this one second. Um, what we can see is there's the, that's the original cable, and this is this cable. I think it's this one. So there's the shield, there's the twist, and there's the conductors of that connection. Um, by the way, this is an attribute text per template. It's my default one that I've got set to display just the, the conductor of the cable. Now if I go into this and say place the bundles, now it's automatically placed my shield symbol and my twist symbol. Remember the symbols can look like anything. So this could have been the Z type shape or the arrowhead shape, depending on requirements. This could have been a dash line instead of a solid line. But it's now placed them and they are associated with that specific connection. Now if we notice, if I make a connection to this, and I'm going to make a connection to this and say to pin 9, what, this, what the software is doing is it's tracking the shield connections. So if I go in and say give me a, a report of the connections, what we'll see is, if I got it on the right sheet screen, we'll see that uh, P22 is the shield is connected to 9 and on P21 it's 6, which we can see from that. So that is coming directly. We can see the information on the, the wire and so on. And we'll look at the output from the other one. So that's, that's a little bit more functionality. Now what I want to do is to show you again, if I've got space over here to show you a little bit, a little bit more of the functionality of the tool as far as uh, wiring and harnesses is concerned. And in this case what I want to do is to say, okay, I want to go in this is a, this specific one is, I think it's 20, 37 pins. I don't want to use all 37 pins. I just want to use several pins. And so there are, there are the pins, terminal pins of these connectors. And if I go and jump to the tree just to show, I can see all of the rest of the pins ready for placement. But I only want to show you some functionality. So again, I'll connect these up. I haven't put a wire or a cable in there yet, but let's look at the device properties. If we look at the device properties of this, what we can see if we look at the pins, first of all, we know what the mating part is because it's telling us that. Now, if, um, if we look at the actual terminal pins associated with each location, we can see that there are two associated with these locations. One is a 20, 20, 20 gauge and one is a 28. 24 gauge. The default is set to the 2420 gauge. So now if I was to look at this and say, okay, what I want to do is to place a, a wire on that. So there's my wire and if I said, okay, I want to place an 18 gauge, notice how I get an error because the 18 gauge doesn't match the size of the pin. Same thing is true for the 30 gauge. So it's telling me that won't work, but however the we do have a pin that will work with the 20, and we do have a pin that will work with the 28. So this time, if I look at my device properties, I can see now, if I look at the pin, pin 1 is the 
default, but if I go to terminal pin 2, it has changed to the alternate one that was assigned to that specific location. And things to note is in the more complex connectors, I can have different terminal pins associated to any location, and that includes quadrax and coax pins. Now, so just a quick explanation of that. When I drag a wire onto a connection, it will say in its interrogation, does that wire match the size of the terminal pin? If it does, allow the connection. If it doesn't, is there a terminal pin that has a wire size that matches that wire? And so if it does, it'll say switch to that terminal pin. And then it'll say if it doesn't, then it won't allow the connection. So that's, that's the functionality that's taking place uh, there. So we can see um, uh, we can see we've got additional functionality throughout the tool. Now, I know I'm going a little bit over time, so let's go in and look at the this one, and I'll show you how uh, it's on sheet one, how I created this drawing just to show you some of the functionality. So now if we zoom into this area, you can see that we've got this, we've got a attribute text template. This one is telling me which wire of this cable. This one tells me the cable and the wire. This one is the signal name, and I've got connections to it. But if I go in and say, okay, I want to make this connection here, all I have to do is to go in and say, well, connect those. So now what I've got is the uh, connection. I've got the mating parts. Now, this is part of the main uh, part of this one. It's just the ones that are available that match up with these parts existing on this, or the pins of the connector that exist on this block. Now, if we go in and say, okay, we want a cable, um, and let's look for, um, let me close this one second, and we'll look for, um, I don't see them in this view, probably because I need to update my library because I just created it this morning. And so this one, alpha wire. So now we've got a cable in here, a shielded cable. We can see the different conductors. So now if I go in and say connect conductors, I can go in and say, okay, let's connect those conductors. And so now we can see the connection information. Um, if I hover across this, I can look at the connection properties. I can look at the cable. I can see what the connection is. I can see which what is uh, pin 1 of P3B, uh, I can look at the, is connected to P1B pin 1, I can see the wires uh, individually connected and so on, and if I go over to the W5 in the device tree, I can see the cable itself, so there's W5 and there's the shield not placed, but I can go in there. I could automatically place it as you saw me before, I could go, or I could go in like so and just make the connection and then say, okay, where is this connected to? I'm not sure, so I'm going to leave it open-ended for now, but it just, that's the type of functionality and that's how quickly I can do it. Now, if I want to go in and say, okay, um, I want to see the rest of the view that we saw in Paul's example, what we could do is to say, well, let's overview this one and say, okay, I want to place a new device view. And in this case, I want it to look more like the, the real thing. So there we go. I'll place that one. And same for this one over here. And so now I'll say place new device view of that. And again, I'll flip that around. And we'll make the connections for that. So there's the connection. If I hover across it, we can see all of the conductors that are in there. We can actually go in, if we zoom in a little bit more to this, we could go in and say, okay, what I want is the um, uh, Tyco connector is the one that I used. And I'll explain this in a second, but I'm, what I'm going to do is just put the back shell in there. So there's the back shell uh, as shown in, in Pulse. Now, this is a component in its own right. I could put it, um, uh, I, I could make it part of the connector by default. So, and then 
other things I can do is say place a new documentation graphic. So there's the documentation graphic for that. If we look, we zoom in, it's the details, it's the pin layout of that particular one. And then I could start by going in and adding additional information to that. So that's my process. Everything is drag and drop. If we'll notice, here we've got the, diff the specific connectors. We've got the back shell associated with it. So there's the back shell with its symbol that we can see popping up in the preview. What you can see also here in red are connect contact pins associated with these connectors. They're red because there's no symbol associated with them because it's just the standard symbol that's used, but there's no graphic, true graphic representation of that, although I could have one. So now if I go back to the original that is complete, um, this is the same drawing that I've completed, and we look at the information associated with this, I could go in and say, well, give me a bill of material from this project, and there it's created the bill of material on the fly, and you'll notice it's item number quantities. So there's my two back shells that I've added with the, I've got device IDs of back shell one and back shell two. I could have associated with them with the um, plugs themselves and given the same definition. There's my cable. Again, it is uh, quantity and the terminal pins. Notice how these are the terminal pins associated with the block itself because I have them as components. I could have just had them as part of the definition of the block and they wouldn't show up. But these are the used pin, uh, contacts and so the uh, quantity is different. And then we've got the, uh, the different items that we've got below. So these are the terminal pins, these are the connectors themselves, these are the cables and the back shells and so on. And that's automatically comes out of that. If we look, we could also go in and say, well, give me a, um, from that, give me a connection list. And so there's a connection list generated. And we can see the signals associated with that. We can see from device pin to device pin. And we see the, the pins that aren't connected. And we can see the ones that are connected with the conductor name of that specific type of cable. The actual color, and this is a strange cable because the conductors are named black one, black two, and so on, and then gauge, and then the name of the cable itself. And if we go, we can also, as another example, say, give me a, uh, a cable list. So there's the cable list. So now it says there's the cable, there's the device, and it's telling me what um, what's connected to what via the conductors within this report. Now, if I got length associated with it, it would sum up the length of all the segments that it went through and give me that length information right there. Now, let's look at the scenario of where I got the length from. In this case, I've just put in a length into my example here, but what I could do is, as far as the tool's concerned, I can do I can uh, develop all of my interconnections. I can define the harness with all of the components of the harness, the back shells, the terminal pins, any labeling, any type of cable protection that I want. The thing that I really don't know, other than by putting it in manually, is the length information. So what we do is we go in and we can interface to uh, mechanical tools any mechanical tool. So what this does, this 3D, we call it the 3D bridge because it is a bridge to the 3D world. So what it does, it interrogates the project for every single cable wire um, within that project. And you can select it based on how you've defined it, whether you've got a harness assembly, something you picked on the screen, or attributes, or a harness. Depends on your definition. And then you can go to any type of um, mechanical tool depending on which one that you're using. So I don't have, as I mentioned, this is a laptop and I don't have NX and SolidWorks and Solid Edge and so on on this laptop, but a quick explanation of what happens is that depending on the tool, if you'll notice if I pick another one, uh, all of this changes based on the requirements of the specific 
mechanical tool. So it will extract the data from the project and generate an output file, typically an XML format, that can be imported into the routing module of the mechanical tool. So in this case, we've got, I have got just two connectors and the wires and cables between them. So what I could do now is I can open up that file in the mechanical tool and so then I can go, when it sees in the listing I've got two connectors, it will say, okay, pick the first one and the first action it does, because the information is there, is to go and get the solid representation of that particular connector. So then you would place it inside the the model of the machine or whatever it happens to be and once that's done it'll say okay the second connector it'll go and pick the model associated with that and so on until all connectors are placed then it looks at the rest of the information and it highlights connections and these are just rough guesstimates of the route it would take so now you can adjust this highlighted line around the model to say okay this looks like the best route for me to take, you can adjust or move the merge points if it's a real harness with many um, connectors hanging off that harness. So you can move those merge points. Once you're happy with it, it will look at the rest of the data and it will flatten up all the segments corresponding to the real diameter. So then you can see if it really fits, you can make more adjustments if you violated bend radiuses and so on. Then you can say, okay, now I'm happy with it. And at that point, it knows the length information and you can import the length information. And it is actually the same file because when we send it over, there's a length field, but it's empty. So then you can bring that length information back into here. And the other thing we could, I didn't show you before is we can look at segment information. We can see what's in each of these segments and see the OD, the makeup, and so on. And that's what the mechanical tool is using for routing purposes. So once you're happy with the route, we can get the length information back here.